<laughs> All right, let's take our seats. Quick, quick. Quick, let's do it quick. Let's go. Let's go. All right. <clears throat> now, questions. Have heard it taught. When commanding demons to leave, does laying on, laying hands on or having hands on allow transference of demons or afflictions? The possibility would be there. But, again, like Dr. Summerall used to say, flies don't land on a hot stove. <laughs> demons don't want on you if you're on fire for God. Yeah. Demons like to draw to you whenever you do. See, it, it's really amazing. The Holy Spirit and demons have similarities in this. They both want you. And they both want all of you. And, the, and now listen. When you look at the word filled, talking about being filled with the Spirit, the word filled mean, doesn't mean filled like as in quantity, like in water, okay? It means literally, if you say, well, man, they were filled with anger when I told them. Okay, they didn't fill up with anger. It means they were so influenced by anger until it moved them or controlled them or influenced them to do something. Do you understand? So being filled with the Spirit is not a quantity thing. It is being so influenced by the Spirit that you do the things He likes. Do you understand? That's what being filled means. Okay, now, it means in union with, in, in fellowship with, that kind of thing. Now, <clears throat> the thing to remember is that when you do what devils like, you get devils. When you do what the Holy Spirit likes, you get Holy Spirit. Right? So it's up to you to decide how much. See, you have all of God in your life that you want. Right now, you have all of God in your life. Now, you may say, oh, no, I want more of God. No, what you do is what you really want. Now, I'm not talking about lip service. I'm not talking about what you say. I'm talking about what you do, because what you really do is what you want. Right? And so what you want, if you, want, if you really wanted more of God, you'd be doing what it took to have more of God. Now, you know what I mean by more of God. We don't get more of God. We get less of us. But I, what I mean is you are... You would do the things that God likes to do. See, and if you, when you got saved, a lot of your old friends quit hanging around you. Why? Because you didn't do the things they like to do. See, a lot of times you don't need devils cast out. Really, all you got to do is get filled with the Spirit, meaning you start doing the things the Spirit likes, and devils won't hang around. You just starve them out. You know, they just, they'll quit hanging around you. So a lot of this stuff is really not as... Um, it's not near as tedious as most people think it is, okay? Now, uh, does this mean that the power of someone else's life or death is in our hands? Yes. Yes, that is a fact. Uh, as well as their possible salvation. Yeah, that's why he said you got to go tell them. He, he said in Ezekiel, if you, go, if you don't tell them and they die in their sins, their blood's on your hand. That's it. Simple as that, right? And he said if you go tell them and warn them and they don't change, then their blood is on their hands. But if you know it and you don't tell them, it's on your hands. Simple as that. Now, it says, um, <clears throat> what if I don't pray and they die? Then that's your fault. Simple as that. You say, well, you're putting condemnation. No, you are by not going and doing it. I'm just reading Bible to you. You, you understand that, right? I'm not putting condemnation on you. You not obeying the word puts condemnation on you. I said, well, there's no condemnation in Christ. Then get in him and do what you're supposed to do. Real simple. But don't think you're in him if you're not doing what he said to do. Because he said, why don't you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say to do. Right? If you say you love God and don't keep his commandments, the Bible says you're a liar. So, so well, no, I really want to. I just have a problem. No, you don't. You ain't got a problem. Your problem is disobedience. Your problem is rebellion. Your problem is you won't bow and submit to God and do what you're supposed to do. Get in Christ. Real simple. The, the Christian life is not hard. You know what makes it hard? When you try to live the Christian life and hang on to the world with the other hand. That's where your struggle is. This isn't near as hard as most people think. Okay? Um, yeah, it says, My pastor says, No, we're not God. We are not God. He is the giver and taker of life. Okay, that, that's not true. He does give life. Okay? But the devil takes it. You understand? So he, God is not the only giver or taker of life. The devil takes life too. See, that's his problem. I, I guarantee you whoever that pastor is has a, 
an over usage of the sovereignty of God. And that what it is, usually that over usage of the sovereignty of God is because you don't want to take responsibility and do what he tells you to do. Okay? God is sovereign, which means he has put things in effect, and his sovereignty actually means that he won't go beyond what he has said. All right? So you have to realize that. Now, uh, it says John Jalek Ministries, download DHT. Yeah, you can do that. You can go online and find the DHT and download it. And uh, I think and we're going to have it free on our website. I know it's free on another website, so you can do that. Now, all right. Uh, Curry, what is your opinion? Revelation 22, 19, once redeemed, can we lose our salvation? All right. Now, <clears throat> why would you want to? <laughs> okay, here's the deal. Remember when the children of Israel came out of the wilderness they went across the Jordan, then they went into the promised land. And he told them, get as far from Jordan as you can, move on in, take the land. They didn't camp on Jordan, right? Most Christians never move on into the promised land. They get over into Jordan, they, they stay on the other side of the bank so they can sneak back over into the wilderness of sin whenever they want to, right? If you don't, it, see, that's why most people, I tell you, most people don't really get saved. They're just convicted sinners. And they come to church to try to hide from the wrath of God because they think by showing up at church gives them brownie points. Right? You have to understand, getting born again means you hate your old life. And what you hate, you don't run back to. See, godly sorrow produces a repentance that you don't need to repent of anymore. Once you turn your back on it, you don't go back. Real simple. I'm not saying you don't make mistakes. See, you, you can, people can push you to a point and you blow up and say something you don't mean to or do something. You can do things. But, but that's different than a life of sin that you stay in and claim to be Christian. If you're living in sin and claiming to be a Christian... Okay, you are the worst advertisement for Christianity because other people know what's going on. Don't think you're fooling anybody. People see your life, and even if they don't know what you're doing, they know that something ain't right because you're not peaceful, you're not happy, you don't have the power of God, you don't have the peace of God, and they know if that's what Christianity is like, I don't want nothing with it. And the thing is, it's, that's not what Christianity is. Christianity isn't trying to avoid hell. Christianity is loving God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. If you do that, you don't worry about losing your salvation. How can, see, you, you can't lose it if you're constantly running in it. Amen? You just, you just need to get on fire and go and run and do what you're supposed to do. There's these things, there's a lot of these things are just, it, it, it's like people saying, how much do I have to do to get saved? Well, the fact that you say that, or, or they say, well, how much do I have to do to stay saved? Well, the fact that you would ask that proves that you're probably not saved. Because you're trying to find the bare minimum. What if I gave you this as the line, and really the line is here, and you run past this but not to this one, guess what? You hadn't made it. Right? Dr. Summerall used to say, better safe than sorry. Right? See, I would, if I, and listen carefully, I would rather believe that you couldn't lose it, but teach you that you could, than to believe that you could lose it and teach you that you couldn't. You understand? Because I would rather tell you, oh, be careful because you'll lose it because at least that'll keep you on your toes. But if I tell you, oh, don't worry about it, you can't ever lose it, then you might live a certain way and you might lose it and be my fault. So I'd rather just say, just be better safe than sorry. I mean, just act like you can lose it and you probably never will. Amen? So, anyway, all right. Now, uh, go with me, let's see. <clears throat> you keep trying to get me in trouble. Okay. Let me read this verse to you. Let's see where we at. Yep. Am I still there? Yeah. Okay. Well, I thought I was going to read it to you. If I can find it here real quick. Mm -hmm. Where are we at? Nope. Hmm. Well, I won't read it to you. <laughs> what am I trying to find here? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm back in Galatians 3 here for just a second. Um, mm -hmm. da, 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 da. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, 28. That verse wasn't there a minute ago. It disappeared. Okay. <coughs> okay. Verse 28. Galatians 3 28. Everybody there? Everybody know, what you, everybody know what I'm talking about here? Okay. If you've seen it. Okay. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Right? Now listen, you need to realize there are not three classes of people. You got it? 
There's not Christian, Gentile, and Jew. You got it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, now what I mean by that is this. <clears throat> if you're in Christ, you're Christian. You're in Christ. I don't care what your ethnic background was, you're in Christ. Amen? So don't get hung up on this thing and that thing. And, well, because remember, if there is a neutral... If, if there is a neutral class of people out there that don't have to receive Christ, then Jesus didn't have to come and die. So there can be no neutral. You are either a child of God or a child of the devil. Jesus said that there is no other way to the Father but by Him. Amen? So there you go. That's simple enough? Okay, now you say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, don't worry about it. Okay, so now go with me to First John. <clears throat> Actually, you know what? what time we, uh, yep, uh, we're going to come back to First John because I want to take you to this other one first because we got to get you here. And First John, I could actually maybe even talk to you about it tonight if I need to. Go to Luke, Luke, chapter four. Luke chapter four. <clears throat> now I probably should have told you, but. You could have held your place in Galatians because we're probably going to go back there. But sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Luke chapter 4. I guess I need to get there too. Okay. <clears throat> we're going to start about verse 16. Yep. Yep. Verse 16. Luke 4 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, obviously, he started quoting. And he said, now this is out of Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, and you'll see it here. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, now notice, he began to say. You know what that means? He didn't get to finish his sentence. And that, that is what it means, right? He began to say. He didn't get to finish it, but he began to say, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we've heard you done in Capernaum, do hear, you also hear in this country, in your country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. And it sounds like he's kind of getting on to him. And so far, it doesn't say they've said anything to him, but it says that they were, all the eyes of them were fastened on him, right? And it said they marveled and wondered at his gracious words. Now, it's, he said, But I tell you a truth, verse 25, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three days and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them, none of who? The widows in the land of Israel. In other words, to no Israelite, God didn't help any Israelite. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Now what's he saying? He said, no prophet is without, is, has any honor in his hometown. He said, look, God has helped a lot of people, but every time he's come in to help, he didn't help the Israelites. What was he getting at? He was hitting their nationalism. He said, because they said, well, we know who our father is. We have Abraham as our father. And he said, don't, don't try to use Abraham as your father. If Abraham was your father, you would love me because Abraham loved me. Right? He said, but you're of your father, the devil. That's what he told him. You're of your father, the devil, because you tried to kill me just like you tried to kill the prophets. Right? Now, that tells you right there who their father was. Why? Because they were into religion and not into Christ. Okay? Now, watch what he says. <clears throat> and so he started doing it. Now, as soon as he did that, now watch this. He, he started hitting their nationalism and saying, just because you're Israelite doesn't mean anything. And, they, and, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. 
One minute they're listening to the gracious words coming out of his mouth, the next minute they're all mad at him. Right? It doesn't take long to get people really upset with you. <laughs> and, he ro- and they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereupon, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. He made them pretty mad because they were going to kill him. Right? All because he told them, just because you're Israelite doesn't mean anything. You've got to follow God. Right? That also answers that question that I just read a minute ago. Or didn't read, but anyway. Now watch. Go back to verse 18. Jesus is quoting this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. Now you can just stop right there. We can read the rest of it. I'm not going to read it every time. What does that say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. Right? The backwards church. What does the church say? We never say that... that we never quote this verse and say that the Spirit of the Lord is upon us because He's anointed us. We say, I'm anointed because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. You say, well, isn't that the same thing? No, nope, it's just the opposite. See, when you put the word because, you mean what you mean to say is if that hadn't happened, then this thing couldn't happen. All right? The Spirit, I need to do it this way, I guess, because you're facing this way. Sorry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me. Past tense, hath. So, if the Spirit of the Lord is upon you because he hath hath anointed you, then apparently the anointing had to happen before the Spirit came on you. Right? See, the church has taught, typically, that the Spirit being on you is the anointing. That's not what that says. That says, the Spirit's upon me because he's anointed me. Not, I'm anointed because the Spirit's upon me. I know I'm going to say it several times. Okay, because I want you to get, do you understand that? In other words, you're not anointed because the Spirit's upon you. See, you, the Spirit coming upon you doesn't anoint you. He's saying the reason the Spirit comes upon you is because you're anointed. So being anointed had to happen first, and then the Spirit came upon you because you were anointed. I, I know this is vastly different, but I, I got so many scriptures here that I'm fixing to show you this. I'm not going to show you all of them because I ain't got time, but I'm going to hit several of them. All right? So just hold your place there for just a second. <clears throat> go with me back to Galatians. See, I told you I was going to go back there. Sorry. <laughs> go back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> Galatians 4. Starting in verse 6. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You hear that? Because your sons, God hath, past past tense, sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. Now, if because your sons, he sent the Spirit, what had to happen before he could send the Spirit? You had to be sons. So isn't that what Jesus said over here? Kind of along the same lines? The Spirit is upon me because, isn't that what we said here? The Spirit is upon us because we're sons. Wouldn't that be the same thing? Right? Just kind of holding you there for a second. So Jesus said the same thing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because. All right? He has sent forth the Spirit of His Son on us because we are sons, right? You got that? So apparently we had to be sons before we could have the Spirit come upon us, right? Now, but now notice, Jesus didn't call that being a son. He said the Spirit come upon us because we're anointed. So apparently, if you tie these two things together, you could say that to be anointed, Jesus said the Spirit, upon, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because, the Lord, because He has anointed me, then the anointing, was when he became a son. Right? And because he was a son, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Right? So we could say that being a son is the same thing as being anointed. So being a son is being anointed, and because you're a son, because you're anointed as a son, then the Spirit comes upon you. So the Spirit coming upon you is not the anointing. Do you get that? I, I'm, no, I'm drilling it home. I'm, I'm hitting this on purpose because I know it's so different from what part, many of you have heard. Okay, go with me. I'll prove it. <clears throat> go with me to, where we go? First uh, Samuel. Yeah, go to First Samuel. See, I told you we'd go to the Old Testament at some point, right? <clears throat> uh, 
really Genesis and 1 Samuel is the main reason I carry a whole Bible instead of just a New Testament. If I could get a New Testament with 1 Samuel and Genesis, I'd just, I wouldn't carry the rest of the Bible for the most part because <clears throat> the law has been done away, so I don't need to study that much, right? Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10, okay? Starting in verse 1. Now, let me tell you about this. First off, this is a story where Samuel goes to find the first king of Israel, which is going to be Saul. He's going to anoint him to be king. Right? That's what's going on. Now, let me ask you this. Was Saul a good king? No. Right? Now, when he turned bad, he started good into bad. When he turned bad, did that surprise God? Did God say, oh, man, I didn't see that coming. Man, Saul, if I'd have seen that, I'd have never made you king in the first place. He didn't do that, did he? So apparently, this idea that, well, the reason God isn't healing you is because he knows you're going to go out and sin. Mm, apparently not. God does things even though he knows you're going to treat it wrong. Why? Because he's still good God regardless of how you treat it. Right? Okay. <clears throat> now, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head. His is Saul. And kissed him and said, is it not because... Now, when it says, is it not, what's he talking about? In other words, isn't the reason I poured oil on your head, isn't, it, isn't the reason I did that, because the Lord hath... Oops, sounds like a past tense word, right? Hath anointed, past tense, anointed, you to be captain over his inheritance. Let's look at that. He takes the oil, pours it, and says, now listen, isn't the reason I've done this, isn't the reason I've done this physical anointing because God has already anointed you to be king. Isn't that what he's saying? Now, notice. So, he, he, here we have a physical anointing, right? Kind of like an ordination. We have a physical anointing, and he says, the reason I am anointing you now is because, I'm just, because God has already anointed you, right? So there was an anointing that happened before he was anointed. Right? There was a spiritual anointing that took place before he was physically anointed. Correct? Are you with me? Okay. Now, and he said, verse 2, When you are departed from me today, then you will find two men by Rachel's grave, Rachel's sepulcher, in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say unto thee. Now, this is Samuel prophesying. It is amazing. He's so specific, and, it, you know, if you're going to get prophesied over, this is what you want. All right, not the yay, yay, God thinks well of you and great things are going to happen, All right? <clears throat> you want it specific like this. And he said, today when you go there, you're going to go here and you're going to see these men and it's just so specific. And they will say to you, the asses which thou wentest to seek are found and lo, your father has left the care of the asses and sorrows for you saying, what shall I do for my son? Then you will go on forward from there and shall come, now watch this, and you will come to the plain of Tabor and there shall meet thee three men. Now, he's still prophesying. You're going to meet three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a bottle of wine. Now, this is specific, right? And they will salute you and give you two loaves of bread, which you will receive of their hands. After that, you will come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when you are come thither to the city... That, they, that you will meet a company of prophets. So now here's a prophet prophesying him meeting a company of prophets. Right? Coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabray and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. So now you got a prophet prophesying prophets prophesying. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> you try to keep score here. Right? It's, it's, it's like the shell game. You're trying to figure out who's doing what. Now watch. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. Whoa, wait a minute. You hear what he said? So he anointed him with oil because he was already anointed sometime before he was anointed with oil. And he said, you're going to go through all this and you're going to see these people and all this is going to happen. They're going to be able to prophesy. And when they do, when they begin to prophesy, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you. So apparently him being anointed had nothing to do with the Spirit being upon him. Right? Because here he is, he was anointed way before the Spirit came upon him. So the Spirit coming upon him didn't anoint him. The Spirit came upon him because he was anointed. 
right? You get that? So apparently anointing has nothing. Now, you notice whenever he was anointed, I would challenge you to do a, a word study on the word anoint, anointed, anointest, right? And anointing. And you're going to find, really, there's only one place. Well, you, well, it depends on how you look at it. But there's a couple places you can find it in the New Testament where it talks about anoint with oil, which is a physical anointing. But <clears throat> there's only one place you really find the word anoint and anointing, and that's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. We're going to look at that in just a minute. But now notice, if you do a study, you're going to find out that there was a couple of things that were anointed in the Old Testament. There were people, they were anointed, which means they were set apart to an office or a position. That's all it meant. And when they were anointed, every time you read it, there was never any power associated with it. Never. Right? They weren't anointed and then power came on them. That wasn't what happened. They were anointed, which, it, see, it's, if you really want a good view of it, it's kind of like the way that when a person is made a knight, all right, at that point, they take a sword, and there's different variations of the wording that was used, but they would take a sword, and now this person walks in, totally normal, walks in, kneels down, the person that's doing the, the knighting, takes a sword, touches the, the shoulders, and then usually the head, and says, you know, I anoint thee, sir, such, and then gives them the name. And from then on, their name starts with sir, right? I mean, come on, now everybody's getting knighted, right? When, when they started, well, you know, Paul McCartney, he's done some things, say, okay, but, okay, when you, when, you, uh, when you knight Elton John, <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't think he would have fit in with the round table, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, knighthood has come down a bit, okay? <clears throat> now, but you have to realize when a person was knighted, when they, when they knelt down, when they stood up, they were essentially the same person. But positionally, they were totally different. And they right? They, they knelt a common person, and when they rose, they were a knight. They were anointed. That's what they say sometimes, is I anoint thee this and when they were rose they were anointed into whatever position so I challenge you to do a word study and if you're not going to do it it won't matter anyway because you're not going to do anything with this stuff right but if you're, if you're going to do something with it you'll go home and you'll study this out because you want to make sure it's right right I mean I hope you do that I don't want you to take my word for anything I want you to go in study it look up the words check it out make sure you know, and, and if you found any discrepancy, you would have a moral obligation to contact me and say, what about this? Amen? Because, you know, we want to be accurate more than anything else. And so, I want you to look at that. Now, what you're going to find, though, is this. There were also other things anointed in the Old Testament. All the utensils of the temple were anointed. Right? Now, they didn't gain supernatural powers. The Spirit of the Lord didn't start hovering over those things, and when you got near them, things started happening. Right? Why? Because the anointing wasn't for power, it was for position. They were anointed into a position. Basically, you know what the anointing was called? Sanctify them. Sanctification is the anointing. When you are separated from profane, common, secular usage and separated unto God for holy usage. That's called sanctification. It's also called anointed. You anoint it to sanctify it. Right? Now, Here's where I want to get across to you because this is the important part. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. So the anointing took place first. Here he was anointed and after he was anointed, six verses later, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Why? Because he was anointed. Right? Luke 4.18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Galatians 4, I showed it to you a while ago. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because you're sons, because you're anointed, because you were separated, because you were placed into a position, God sent his spirit. The anointing is not for power, it's for position. You were anointed a son. You could also use the word appoint. To be anointed means to be appointed. They were anointed king, they were appointed king. Same thing, right? You can use that interchangeably. Now, you have to realize, though, that the anointing, the separation, the way that is, is that you are sealed by the Spirit of God so that the Spirit of God births you and sets you apart as a son, right? 
Now, because you're a son, he sends his spirit into you. But it is his spirit that separates you in the beginning. So we can find a twofold aspect of the spirit. One is for anointing, and the other is for the spirit of the Lord coming upon you. Well, that's called the new birth and the baptism in the spirit. That's all that is, right? The new birth is the anointing. The baptism in the spirit is not the anointing. The baptism in the spirit is when the spirit comes upon you for power. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power. That word power is the Greek word dunamis. It means ability or miraculous ability. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Who is the Holy Ghost? The Spirit. So you're going to receive power, power, ability, not authority. You got authority when you got born again. Right? Why? Because you're in Him, and it's His authority. So you, you receive authority. Now, let me, let me show you. Go with me real quick to Luke chapter 10. Luke 10. And hopefully I can get you to believe the whole verse. <clears throat> now. Actually, you know what? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't tell you where we're going to go, so I can tell you where we're going to go, and you won't know that I'm going to another place I was going to tell you to go anyway. Yep. So. <clears throat> now. <laughs> so we'll start in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> after the, now that's not where I was going to go, but it's, we'll end up at the other place anyway. Okay. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, that word send forth, you would think, if you know anything about Greek, you would think to send forth would be the Greek word apostello, which means to, to apostle. Okay, is the way that you would say it. That, that he would send them forth as apostles. That's not the word. The word he used here is the Greek word ekbalo. And it, it doesn't, it technically, to say send forth is a very weak way of saying it. Actually, the word ekbalo is the exact same word Jesus used when he said, cast out devils. You get that? So he said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would cast out laborers, not just send forth. See, send forth means to send on a mission like an apostle, but that's not what he said. He said, you are to throw out laborers. Now, I always tell everybody it's easier to cast out a devil than it is to cast out a Christian. Why? Because devils know they have to listen to you. Christians think that they can, well, I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. I see. It, it, it's easier. Devils have to listen. Amen? <clears throat> but he said, pray the Lord of the harvest. He would send forth, cast out laborers into his harvest. He said, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. In other words, waste no time. And into whatsoever house you enter. Now, what's he talking about? A house. You go into a house, right? Whatever house you go into, first say, peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. Now, this shows that peace is an actual force that you can sense. Okay? How many of you ever walked into a house where somebody is fighting? You can tell it. Well, you're not sensing peace. You're sensing the absence of peace. Okay? Now... You ought to be able to sense peace the same way. It says, If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Now, so what's he talking about? A house. Right? When you go into the house, here's what you do. What do you do in the house? You go in there, you eat, you drink, you do, right? You got it? Now, verse 8. And into whatsoever city you enter. So is he still talking about a house? No, he's talking about a city. Right? So it changed. It just enlarged. Before he was talking about a house, now he was talking about a city. So we know what to do in the house. What do we do in the city? Okay? He says, Whatever city you enter, and they receive you. Eat such things as are set before you. You know what that means? That means you've got to be careful where you sit. <laughs> That's why I watch where I sit. Because if I have to eat what's set before me, <laughs> I let them put the food down first, and then I decide where I'm going to sit. So anyway, okay. 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 <clears throat> If it's, if it's vegetables, we're going to trade places. <laughs> okay? 
and into whatever city you enter, and they receive you. Eat such things that are set before you. Now watch, in verse 9, and, and what? In the city that you go in, in whatever city you go into, heal these sick that are therein. Is that what it says? Now, is there any qualification there? Heal the sick that have enough faith. Heal the sick that deserve it. Heal the sick that treat you nice. He doesn't say that, does he? He says, whatever city you go into, heal the sick therein. Therein where? In the city. That means any sick in the city are to be healed. Do you get that? That means no excuses, no nothing. Now see, that does away with most healing teaching right there. You can just go about doing good. Oh, that sounds like a scripture. Doesn't it? Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Is God with you? Then why aren't you going about doing good and healing all the oppressed of the devil? He didn't say he did it because of any other reason other than the fact that God was with him. Jesus said, the works that I do, now, I'm, I'm going to say this very carefully because I want you to get every word of this. Jesus said, the works that I do shall he, right? Not they, he, you see, there's teaching out there that God gave so much power to the body of Christ and it's divided equally amongst every person and every person has a little bit of the power. That's not scriptural. Jesus did, if, he, if that had been scriptural, he would have said, what, all, you know, whatsoever works or <clears throat> whatever works I did, he that believeth on me, the works that I did, they shall do. He didn't say they. He said he, individuals, can do the works of Jesus. You get it? Any individual can do the works of Jesus. And not only that, but greater works than these shall he do. Because he fasts and prays all the time. <laughs> that him what he says? No, I think he said, because, he, he says, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father. So you can do greater works not based on what you do, but because of what he did, because he went to the Father. Why? Because that finished everything. Do you get that? You do greater works not because of what you do but because of what he did. So again, you heal the sick by grace. Not in your name, in his name. If it's based on what you do, you would do it in your name. Right? Just trying to drill this in. Right? You'll notice this whole seminar is really only about five or six things that I say it about a thousand different ways. <laughs> right? That's all it is. Well, <clears throat> repetition is the mother of memory. Right? God has freed me from the fear of repetition. I have no fear of repeating myself over and over and over again. Okay? Now, he says, Heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Now notice, he said, first, heal the sick, and say. He didn't say say, and then heal. Well, they got to they have faith, so first you got to preach to them so they can get faith, and you, then you can heal. No, he said heal first, and when they get healed, then you tell them kingdom of God has come near to you. So you heal first and then preach, right? Once you get somebody well, they're a lot more likely to listen to you. Amen? I had lunch with a, a gentleman today, and we were talking about he works in, uh, in India and different places, and they're planting churches, and it's uh, amazing work. I'm, I'm really, we're going to start working together, and I'm teaching in their school and that kind of stuff, and things are looking out there, working out really good. And so, but he, he said that over 80, I think he said 80 to 85 percent of all, they've had... Um, this, I think when he goes over there pretty soon, they're fixing to do a baptism of 1,300 new converts. 1,300, right? In one village. You ought to hear the story how the village got saved. It's amazing. It's good stuff. Well, he said that <clears throat> they've been working on it for some time now, but they have over 100, let me, let me think. I don't want to get the details wrong, so I'm not going to give a lot of details. But I know he said they had something like 213,000 Christians that are worshiping in their churches, in their organization. 213,000. He said out of that, 80 to 85% of them came to Christ after witnessing a power encounter of someone getting healed. Right? That's the way the Bible does it. Right? Not in the wisdom of men's teaching or words, but in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. Amen? That's where your faith ought to stand. So, he says here, Somebody needs to unplug that clock. That thing's just running way too fast. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. He said, so you go in, you, you heal first, then you preach. But into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not, go your ways out in the streets and same and say, Never, even the de very dust of your city that cleaves on us, we do wipe off against you. 
notwithstanding be sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Now notice, he said, if you go in there, don't receive you. Then you go out of the city and you dust your feet and then you say the kingdom of God has come. But before they could not receive you, you have to heal the sick. Because he said, when you go in there, first off, you heal the sick, right? Before you preach. Well, if you're going to go in there, see, if they don't receive you, it's going to be because of what's going on or what you say. But before, if you go in and heal first, then, then they don't receive you. Then as you leave, you say, hey, you can kick us out, but regardless, the kingdom of God has come nigh to you. Why? Because we've proven it, right? He didn't say if they're going they don't receive you, just walk out and don't say nothing. And when you get out in the street, say, oh, the kingdom of God has come near to you. No, that doesn't mean nothing to them. He's saying, basically, what are you doing? You're still going to heal the sick. You're still going to say the kingdom of God has come nigh to you. The only difference is, one, you get to do it while you're there. The other, you get to do it after you leave, right? Because they're kicking you out, right? Now, <clears throat> notice this. Going down. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see yeah go down to verse well you can go to verse 16 he that hears you hears me he that despises you despises me he that despises me despises him that sent me and watch and the 70 returned again un with joy saying Lord even the devils are subject to unto us through your name and he said unto them I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven behold I give unto you power to tra and that word power there is a Greek word exousia it means authority he said, I give you authority, right? Now, this is, this is delegated authority. You have to remember, you don't have delegated authority. You have inherited authority because you're in him, and the inherited authority can't be taken from you because you're in him, and it's his authority. It's not even yours, okay? But they had delegated authority because he said, go do this, and when they finished their mission, that stopped until the next mission, and he told them to do it again, right? So he had to tell them each time to do it. Why? Because it was delegated because they weren't born of the Spirit, so they didn't have the inherited ability. You get that? Now, he says, Behold, I give unto you power, authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over some of the power. Is that what it says? Some? It says all, not some. Right? Now, if it says all, not some, why do you think it means some? You say it doesn't. Then why do you act like it does? Well, I don't know what to do. To see, we can do this, but I, I don't know about this one. No, you have authority over all. Jesus never gave authority over some not not ever he never gave because authority over some is not demonstrative of the kingdom of god the kingdom of god to be the kingdom of god has to show that you have a power over everything that is not of god anything less than that is does not demonstrate the kingdom which was the purpose of jesus's mission which was to come and proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom this is how the kingdom operates. What kingdom? The kingdom of heaven. This is the way it's done in heaven. Let me show you what it looks like in heaven. Crippled bodies are made whole. Well, you can't do some of them because there's not going to be some crippled bodies in heaven and some healed bodies. Amen? So you just got to get... If once you get this overall picture, everything changes because you start to realize it's not about you and it's not about how much power you have and what you can do. It has to do with what you're doing. Amen? Now, I got to get you out of here. It's... it's I got to send you on break. <clears throat> I say as I keep reading. Now, and over all the power of the enemy. Now, notice this. Behold, I give you power. I give unto you power, authority, over to tread upon service scorpions, and over all the power. And that word power is the Greek word dunamis. And over all the power, the dunamis of the enemy. In other words, he said, I'm giving you authority over the ability of the enemy. You notice he didn't say, I'm giving you authority over the enemy's authority. Why? Because the enemy doesn't have authority. He was a liar and a robber and a thief and a murderer from the beginning. Yeah. He does not have authority. He's, never had a, he's always been a renegade, rebel spirit, an enemy of God, and he has no rights. He is a criminal before God. You understand? He doesn't, now look, a criminal doesn't need authority. All they need is ability. Well, he has ability because he is a spirit being. So he has certain abilities. But even though he has the ability, see, this is where people get messed up. You know, that's going to drive the people on the videos just wild. You know, <laughs> it's still not working. There we go. There, there, there we go. Okay. okay. 
I don't know. You might want to give me a handheld. I, I don't know. Something about lounge thing. Volare. <laughs> 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 All right, there we go. We got sound. Okay, now, I have no idea where I was at. Now. Okay, All right. yeah, you have authority over all the ability of the enemy. Amen? The enemy has ability. He doesn't need authority. He's got ability. See, criminals don't need authority. They have ability. That's why they're criminals. If they had authority, they wouldn't be criminals. See, a, a, crim a, a bank robber isn't a bank robber if he's got the authority to take the money out. He's only a bank robber because he doesn't have authority. But if he doesn't have ability, he's not going to get the money out. So he can have ability without authority. But people think because the devil has the ability to do it, he must have the authority to do it. He doesn't have authority. He has ability. The deal is that you have authority over all the ability of the enemy. Yeah. You have the authority. Now, the beauty of it is, now notice this. Now listen carefully. At this point here, this is the amazing part because John Lake... And I didn't give you a lot of history on him, but I want you to know, by the time he was 21 years old, he had 16 brothers and sisters. By the time he was 21, eight of them had died of sickness and disease, right? Which is why he went after sickness and disease. God didn't just pick him out and give him a gift. He went after it. He found a man that was operating in power, and he said, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to study divine healing so I can practice it and teach it. And then he did, and he went and taught it, and he started 100,000 healings in five years by teaching 16 other men and women to do the same thing he did, right? It wasn't God just saw him and said, oh, here's a gift, boom, there you go. It wasn't that at all. He went after it. Now, the thing is, <clears throat> whenever he got hooked up with John Alexander Dowie, who was the man that had all this tremendous power, his, uh, several of his brothers and sisters got healed. And so then his wife started to die, and they couldn't get her to him. So they wrote a telegram and said, pray, my wife is dying. And Dowie wrote back and said, I am praying she will live. That's it. No long prayers. And they, well, they did find out he was going to pray at 9.30 the next morning. So they're all gathered around the bed. She's looking at the clock. They look up. She says, it's 9.30. Dowie must be praying. I must be healed. <laughs> and got up out of bed and was completely healed. Amen. Didn't feel anything, but just said, I know if he's praying, he gets results. If he's praying, I must be healed. And got up, was healed. Well, then they moved there. And Dowie was an amazing man. He went, and, and he wasn't all right in his doctrine thing, but he was very strict and very hard line. But he, he had, and, and he came from here in Australia, as a matter of fact, and was near here. And, and this is where he first saw the revelation that God, that Christ was the healer and that sickness was of the devil. And he used Acts 10, 38 to stop a, a, literally a plague that was going through his area that was killing half of his church members. <clears throat> and then he got in a boat and went up to America in 1888 and landed in San Francisco and then went over to, to, Zion, or to uh, Chicago, Illinois. And while he was there, Lake found out about him, went there, started studying. But Lake lived a good ways from him, and Lake became an elder in his church. Now, the thing about Dowie was this was from 18, about 1888 up until 1907 when Dowie died. Well, when Dowie died in 1907, the Pentecostal movement had already started from 1901. But Dowie was completely against it and said, that's not of God. I mean, he just blasted it, really blasted all the Pentecostals. So the, the Pentecostal message didn't come to Zion until 1906. And when he came in there, they blasted uh, Parham, who came in, and they said, we're not going to rent. They, they told everybody there, do not rent a building to this man. Told everybody in the city, you will not rent a building to this man for him to hold meetings. So they went into the houses. And he went to a woman's house named Marie Burgess, who actually became one of the big Assembly of God people and pastor of the uh, Glad Tidings Temple in New York. Amazing woman of God. But the two first people that got baptized in the Spirit there, the first person was Marie Burgess. The second person was a visitor in her home, and his name was F.F. F. Bosworth. He was the first male to be baptized in the Spirit there. Well, then <clears throat> it kind of started growing. But now you have to remember, this is 1907. So from eight, literally uh, when Lake got hooked up with Dowie was about 1891, 93, actually 1893. And he and uh, Jenny, his wife, was healed in 1898. But between 1893 and 1898, that's five years, Lake was already ministering healing based on what Dowie taught. Dowie taught healing in the atonement. That's really all he had. And he, he did talk about some gifts and things, but not much. He would talk about them, but he had no idea how they worked. So he would talk about healing in the atonement. Tremendous healings. I'm telling you, you see the pictures, crutches, canes, just phenomenal. Did not have the baptism of the Spirit. Was healing the sick without the baptism of the Spirit. 
Why? Because he had authority as a son. He was ministering not under the ability of the spirit, but under the authority of the son. You understand? John Lake was getting great results in healing from 1893 up until 1907, and then he got baptized in the spirit in October 1907. Tremendous healings. He had better healings before his baptism than most Christians have after their baptism. And so that makes no sense if you believe that the power in the sense of you know, receiving power comes after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, Acts 1-8, which the Bible does say. But he didn't operate by power. He operated by authority. He commanded and it obeyed. So there's a difference between authority and ability. But you shall receive ability. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You don't have just authority in Christ. You have ability that is resonant within you because it is the tangibility of the Spirit that actually affects the, the cure. You understand? So there is something more than just authority. You have authority as a son. Then you have the ability of the Spirit. And between the two, you should get it done every time. Yes. Amen? Do you get that? Yes. Now, <clears throat> the reason I said that is because I wanted to get you to Acts 10, or I'm sorry, Luke 10, 19. Now, we're, i got to get you out of here. But yeah. <clears throat> now, notice. I give unto you power, authority, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the ability of the enemy, and nothing, nothing, you hear that? Not, not some things, and certainly not everything. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. But if you lay hands on somebody and they got a devil, can it come back on you? And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Why? Because you have authority and now ability over the ability of the enemy. But, but should you lay hands on somebody, if it, no, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But yeah, but what about retaliation? Yeah, the enemy will try to retaliate, but, and, but you have to decide and believe. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. See, if you think things can hurt you, you you'll shy away from it. You'll think, man, last time I prayed for somebody, man, all oh, hell came against me. I don't want that again, so I'm not going to. No, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Go after it, blast it, believe it. Believing turns on the switch that repels the stuff. You understand? What you believe, you get. So whatever you're getting, you believe. So quit believing some of the stuff you're believing. Start believing the Bible. Believe that nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen? Now, this is good news. I mean, do you realize just what I've taught you today? Just some of the details of the things of uh, that nothing can hurt you, that nothing can touch you, that you have authority and you have ability to, over all the power of the enemy, over all his ability, and you can go and you can preach the gospel and you can heal all the sick in the city. Amen? Amen. And then you tell them, ah, the kingdom of God is coming out of you. Why? Because this is the way it is in heaven. It's the way it's supposed to be here. Why? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's all I'm doing. I am fulfilling the, the prayer of Jesus. I, I am the answer to Jesus' prayer. You understand? You're the answer to Jesus' prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If it's going to be done on earth as it is in heaven, you're going to have to do it. Because it's not going to happen automatically. Because if it did, he wouldn't have told us to pray it. Right? Well, the sovereignty of God, if God wants to heal me, he can do it. He doesn't take a man's hands. No, the sovereignty of God said, I desire to heal by the laying on of hands of a believer. Well, God can do it any way he wants to. Then let him. He wants to do it through the laying on of hands. <laughs> Right? It's amazing when you look at this stuff. I mean, y'all getting a hold of this? This stuff is easy, it's simple. All, the, the believing is it. It's not the knowing, it's the believing. You just got to decide to believe. Then just choose. This is the way it'll be. Nothing can hurt me. Nothing by any means can hurt me. Amen? All right. Y'all, let's see, it's 4.30. What time are we supposed to get here? Five? Okay. Um, what do y'all want to do? It's up to y'all. I can keep going. I'm good. So y'all want to keep going? We're good? You need to change out anything, CD or anything like that or whatever? We're good? Okay. Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay, because there is, there is a couple more places I want to take you real quick if we can get there. <clears throat> Matter of fact, since we're talking about the anointing, might as well go ahead and talk about it, right? Go ahead and take the rest place. Go with me over to, where do we want to go? Let's go to First Samuel. Yep, go to First Samuel. Okay, I appreciate y'all hanging in there. Y'all are troopers. We can get this done. First Samuel. Come on, there we go. Now, let's look at this. 
First Samuel chapter, hmm, hmm, let me see. Uh, actually, you want to go to First Samuel? No? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go to Judges. <coughs> sorry about that. I was going to talk to you about David and his anointing. You know about David's anointing. When God anointed David, he anointed him in place of, of Saul. And it said clearly that when God anointed David, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. It was always there, right? It didn't come and go. It was always there, right? That's the kind of anointing we're supposed to walk in. But I'm going to show you a different kind. Go to Judges. <coughs> Judges chapter 13. Judges 13, verse 20. Now, how many of you know, this is the story of Samson. How many of you know Samson's father's name? Manoah. Manoah. Yeah, exactly. Now, wouldn't you think if the son's name is Samson, the father's name would be Sam? <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? Makes sense. It's Sam's son. That's a Samson. Oh, I know Sam. That's Sam's son right there. I mean, come on. You know, it's amazing. And you... I know, you know, if somebody's going to rewrite the Bible, they ought to change the names. You ever know? I mean, change the names of people, change the name of places. I mean, because there are some names in here you just can't pronounce. <laughs> Amen? I wonder if they, sometimes they didn't change the names just so we, they would sound funny saying them. You know? Their real name was Bill. <laughs> you know? Instead of Methuselah, you know, in the year that Bill died. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a Bible name. We have to call him Methuselah. Right? So, all right. Now notice, <laughs> see, and you wonder what goes on in the mind of a healing evangelist. Well, there you go. That's it. <laughs> I have way too much time to think. <laughs> now, uh, where are we at? Judges 13, verse 24. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtab. Right? You got that now, right? The Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times. That means the Spirit came upon him and began to move him at times, right? Now, he was anointed a judge of Israel, but the Spirit came upon him at times and began to move him at times, right? Now, he was always a judge of Israel, even when the Spirit wasn't upon him moving him. But when the Spirit came upon him, it moved him, right? So if the Spirit is upon you all the time, the Spirit ought to move you all the time, right? Well, you don't have the Spirit part of the time. The anointing abides within you. He stays, right? He's with you all the time. He doesn't leave you. So he ought to move, he ought to move you all the time, right? It sounds kind of like Romans 8, 14. As many as are led constantly, consistently by the Spirit, they are the sons of God, right? Okay, just throwing that in there for you to think about. Now, <clears throat> go with me over to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. Now, I'm not going to get graphic with this because this is pretty, pretty, Explicit in some ways. So we're just going to read through it, but it is the Bible, okay? Judges chapter 16, still talking about Samson. I just gave you the, how the Spirit of the Lord came upon him at that point and how he got started. Then it says in verse 1, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. Now that's not the way a man of God's life is supposed to read, right? Unfortunately, too often it does. <laughs> But anyway, let's move on. It says, And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it's day, we shall kill him. Right? So now, you get the idea here. Samson goes into a harlot, and he's there all night. Right? Okay. And, they, and now all the guys come around, all these Gazites, they come around, and they're saying, We're going to wait here, and when he comes out in the morning, we're going to kill him. Okay, And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the hill, top of a hill, that is before Hebron. Now you notice he did that by the Spirit of God after he left a harlot. So sin didn't take away the power. Right? And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Now notice Delilah was not a harlot. Right? The woman he went into, the harlot before, was not Delilah. So Delilah is another woman. She's not a, well now she was apparently a fairly loose woman, but she, she wasn't the harlot that was referred to. Right? 
and the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lies, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. Now notice, first off, they said, listen, we want to know where Samson's power comes from. Now what does that tell you? That tells you, first off, that Samson did not look like a bodybuilder. Right? You look at a bodybuilder, you don't go, where does he get that strength? <laughs> right? You can tell where he gets the strength. He's got the arms, he's got the muscle, right? So apparently Samson didn't look like that because they said, listen, we want to know where his strength comes from. He probably looked like Woody Allen. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. If you saw Woody Allen take the gates of a city off, you would say, where does he get that power? <laughs> right? But if you saw somebody, some big bodybuilder, you wouldn't say that. You'd go, well, wow, oh, look what he did. Right? So apparently he didn't look like that, right? Now watch. <clears throat> he says, so they're trying to figure it out, and they say, we'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver, every one of us. And Delilah said to Samson, pray, tell me, I pray thee, wherein your great strength lies, and wherewith you mightest be bound to afflict you. All right, now, if a woman ever says, where's your strength, and what do I have to do to bind you so that I can afflict you? Okay. Don't tell her, okay? <laughs> I mean, right there you can tell he wasn't the sharpest tack in the box, right? I mean, you know, you picture, back in, especially back in the day, you would picture him looking like Sylvester Stallone or somebody. Remember when Stallone was all buffed up and all that? You could picture Stallone, you know, playing the Rocky character. You could see him playing Samson because they were both kind of the same er character, you know, kind of really not all that sharp. <laughs> Yo, you know? Delilah. <laughs> you know, you can see it. Can you see it? You can see him. You know, you can just picture him, right? But, so you know he had that kind of money. But apparently he was kind of like that because he told her, right? That, and this was amazing. He says, and Samson said unto her, if you bind me with seven green whisks that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green whisks which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now stop right there. Okay, he tells her, now, now think about this, you're visiting a woman, and she says, hey, how, what can I tie you up with? <laughs> I, I, I told you I'm not going to get graphic in here, but <laughs> if she says that, and then you tell her, and while you're sitting there talking, hello, seven green whisks for Delilah. <laughs> You know, that might be a clue something's up, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, if, now watch, because that's what, that's what happened. They brought it up. He's there. It didn't say he went home. It said he's there, right? So he's there, and these seven green whisks show up. Now watch. And it says, Then the lords of the Philistines brought up her seven green whisks, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now, I can't just, I can, I, what was he doing? Were he just sitting in a chair? You know, talking to her, and she's walking around him, tying him up. <laughs> I told you, this is, we'd have to put some kind of rating on this if we were going to really talk about it, okay? <laughs> it says, now there were, now watch this, this is the amazing thing. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. <laughs> okay, something ain't right here, okay? Okay? <laughs> Samson's sitting there talking to her. She's tying him up. First off, she, he tells her, she says, what, what, what can I tie you up with that you couldn't get loose? Oh, well, get this. Okay. Then it shows up. Then she starts tying him up. Now, you would think there were men like, now, I don't know where they were hiding. I mean, you would think, if, you know, if, okay, if I was standing here talking and there was a guy hiding behind that plant, <laughs> you'd think somebody would see it, don't you think? You'd think Samson would have seen somebody's feet underneath the curtain sticking out. <laughs> right? But apparently, he didn't care, <clears throat> which is another whole thing in itself. <laughs> and then, now watch. And it said, now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber, and she said unto him, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he broke the whisk as a thread of tow is broken when it touches the fire, so his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, behold, you've mocked me. And told me lies. 
Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. Now see, we have an old saying in the States that says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Right? Now she just tied him up. He breaks loose. Then she says, you, you mock me. You've lied to me. Now tell me the truth. How can I tie you up and you can't get loose? And he said, if you bind me fast with new ropes, that ne you ever seen a, a, a puppy or a dog that you can spank them, get onto them, and they'll run away and cry, and then they'll turn right around and walk right back up to you? You ever notice that? That's kind of the way I picture Samson here. She's doing all this stuff, he, and he just forgets, you know, two seconds later, what? Uh, you did uh, okay. I mean, just completely forgot, you know? And he says, and he said to her, if you bind me with fast with new ropes that were never occupied there, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes. Where'd she get those? <laughs> I mean, everything she asked for, keep, everything he says, keeps showing up. Okay, there's got to be somebody delivering this stuff, right? And bound him therewith and said unto him, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait, abiding in the chamber, and he, and he broke them off from his arms like a thread. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If you weave the seven locks of my head. I mean, this guy is, this is ridiculous. Yeah, dumb. That's the best way to say it. That's what I said. I mean, Sylvester Stone would have played the part by dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing. You know, because we read these, and it's funny because, as I've said before, when you think about these things, you think about, because you picture somebody here, you know, and when you picture characters in the Bible, you have to put some face with them. I mean, if you, come on, if you read about Moses, Charlton Heston, it's going to be Charlton Heston, right? I mean, no matter, I don't care, and, you know, and you watch him, and you watch him in the Ten Commandments, and then later he comes out with Planet of the Apes. <laughs> and you're thinking, somebody help Moses. <laughs> Get those monkeys off of Moses. You know, you start thinking, Moses, where's your staff? You know? You're going to be able to take those monkeys out with your staff, you know? I mean, he will always be Moses, right? <clears throat> but the funny thing is, they were doing a little bit of research. I found out, you know who's, who tried out for Moses first before Charlton Heston? John Wayne. <laughs> now, can you picture that? Can you picture John Wayne as Moses? I mean, can't you just see him? I mean, because, I mean, he was, I mean, first, he, I mean, he had that walk, you know what I'm talking about? He had that kind of that, that. <laughs> can, you, can you picture me? Well, I tell you what you're going to do, Pharaoh. <laughs> can you see it? Hey, I can. You're going to let my people go. <laughs> yeah. Come on, isn't it? I mean, you know that's what, you know he'd have done that, right? I mean, can't you just picture him like that? I mean, and you, you look, <laughs> but you, you see these people, you know, and I always, because they said that Moses had a speech impediment. You know, he was slow of speech, they said. So I just figured they, they should have cast Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> right, can you say? Well, 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 I'll, t I'll tell you what you're going to do. Well, <laughs> I mean, that, I mean that, you know, you know why they didn't? Because the movie would have been twice as long. <laughs> it would have had to be, right? So there. And then you, you, now I'm showing my age here some because you remember, you remember the old. Um, anybody here know, remember who Walter Brennan was? You remember Walter Brennan? Because see, whenever you know, whenever they did the the life of of Paul with uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins, he was amazing. I mean, he did Paul so perfectly. And, of course, then right after that, he did Hannibal Lecter. 
you know, so, so just shows how good an actor he was. But he did Paul. But I always pictured before Anthony Hopkins, I always pictured Walter Brennan like Paul. You know, I mean, because that's back before I realized that his thorn in the flesh wasn't a physical thing. You know, because Walter Brennan had that 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 limp that he had. He had, a, you know, <laughs> but, but I can just picture him talking to to Timothy. You know, Timothy, flee, flee. <laughs> you know, you know, you, can't you just picture him sitting? I mean, he's kind of bald headed in the top there and has the hair, and you just picture him as Paul. <clears throat> See, like I told you, I get way too much time on the road by myself. <laughs> 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 Now, uh, that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I'm just, <laughs> just kind of picture these people. I'm just kind of make them real. You know, I did tell you before, <clears throat> see, what God intended, God wanted the body of Christ to be Rambo. You know, Sylvester Stallone, the big M60 jumps out there with the headband, and the bandoliers, the little bullets. That's the way the body of Christ is supposed to be, kicking the door, and you got that M60. I mean, the thing is just there, and you're just coming in and, and just winning, right? And instead, he gets Barney Fife. Yeah. Can you picture it? Barney Fife, he's got the gun, doesn't have any bullets, bullets in his pocket. <laughs> That's the way the body of Christ is. Oh, we got the Holy Ghost, you know, we got the Holy Ghost, but we can't load the gun and use it until Andy says so. <laughs> and when we finally do get it loaded, we shoot ourselves in the foot. <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> it just gives you an idea how we're supposed to look and what we should be, right? <clears throat> now watch, let's get back over here. Now watch. He says, You've told me lies, verse 14, and she fastened it with the pen, said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep, and he went away with the pen of the beam and with the web. And she said unto him, How can you say I love you? <laughs> I, you know, I think I'd be him saying, How can you say you love me? How can, you keep tying me up, and these Philistines keep jumping out on me. What's the deal here? You know? She said, when your heart is not with me, you have mocked me these three times and not told me wherein your great strength lies. And it came to pass, now watch this, here's the key, verse 16, and it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, all right? That's King James for she nagged him, <laughs> right? And men, you know what that is, don't you? No, no hey, watch it, watch it. <laughs> But she just kept pushing, just kept pushing. Now watch. That she nagged him. Well, that's not what it says. Wait a minute. Vexed unto death. Let me get back in King James. Okay. That he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall, be be and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once. For he showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her, brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees. Now, I don't know about him, but I'd be a little leery about falling asleep around that woman. Don't you think? <laughs> and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. Now, I don't know how he slept through that. You know, because they didn't, they didn't have modern <laughs> things today, okay? And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, now here's the key, I will go out as at other times before. That means it, what he's fixing to do, he's done before, right? And shake myself. Now what do you mean shake yourself? Well, we don't, we're not sure because I mean other than just mean shake. Maybe it was kind of like these uh, pro wrestler guys do when they get out there and work themselves up into a frenzy or something like that. But I do know that the, the New Testament equivalent is he stirred up himself. All right? Now watch. <clears throat> and it says that he, where were we at there? Yeah. And he said, well, well, I got way up there. Now, I'll go out as a times before and shake myself. Now watch this. And he wist not or knew not that the Lord was departed from him. You hear that? But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. So you know what happened. But notice what he said. He got up. He said, I'm going to do what I've always done. I'm going to go out and I'm going to shake myself and kill some Philistines. Right? And he went out and he didn't know that the spirit of the Lord had left him. You know what that means? Number one, it means that every time before, he did the same thing. It also means that the spirit of the Lord being upon him had no feeling. Right? Right? Because had it had a feeling, 
he would have known it wasn't there. So that means that every time he went out, he had to step out in faith, stir himself up, and step out in faith that God was with him because he had never felt anything. Amen? The power of the Spirit coming upon you has no feeling. People say, well, I, I don't feel powerful. Feeling power, there is no feeling powerful. Usually when you feel powerful, it's soulish, and that's when you're weakest. When you're weak, that's when you're strong. When, what it means is, Paul said, when I am weak, then I'm made strong. Isn't that right? And he said, the reason he said that is not that he was weak because he had the power of the Spirit. But what he said was, when I'm not leaning on my own strength, when I'm leaning on the strength of God, that's when I'm strong. You understand? And so it doesn't have a feeling. Imagine if the Spirit, now think about this. If the Spirit came with a feeling, then after a while you'd get used to the feeling then you wouldn't feel the feeling. So as far as you know, you feel powerful right now. Right? Because the Bible says, you shall receive ability, power. After that, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. So when the Holy Ghost came upon you, you got power. So whatever it is when he came upon you, that's when the power came. Now, and he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. 1 John 2, 27 says, you have received an anointing that abides. Right? Didn't come and go. So however you feel right now, that this is what it feels like to have this, the power of the Spirit upon you. This is what it feels like. Why? Now, if it had another feeling, you wouldn't walk by faith. You'd be walking by feeling. See? Now, if you go to Hebrews 11, which you don't have to go there right now. I'm just mentioning this to you because I'm going to let you out of here. <clears throat> but if you went to Hebrews 11, you will find that Samson is mentioned. Samson is right there. He said, what shall I say of Samson and Gideon and Jephthah? Uh, he said, the time would fail me. I don't have time to get into it. But he mentioned Samson in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith as a man of faith. Why? So we know he was a man of faith. So we know he didn't walk by sight. He walked by faith, which is what he did here. He didn't walk by sight. He walked by faith. He stepped out in faith, trusting that God was with him. He had no feeling associated with it. He couldn't tell if the spirit was gone. You can't tell when the spirit's on you and when it's not. Amen? You see how simple that is? The Spirit comes upon you, and you can't even tell it. But the key is, number one, that you are anointed, appointed a son. And because you're a son, you believe the truth of the Word of God. Because you're a son, he sends his Spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. And when, it, when the Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost come upon you. Now, you have to decide, are you going to walk in faith, which means in accordance with what the Word of God says, or are you going to walk by sight, which means you're going to wait for some goosebumps or something. Because you're not going to have goosebumps in the grocery store unless you're in the frozen food section. <coughs> okay? I've learned I'm, I'm the same anywhere I go. Whatever I do. That was one of the things that surprised Sid Roth when we were there. We went out to a Red Robin to eat. And it was a hamburger place. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. But anyway, <coughs> we went out to eat. And he said, so you can do this anywhere? I said, yeah, anywhere. And so he started looking for sick people. <laughs> and, and finally found some. You know? But it's amazing. People get... People think that it has to be in a church service or it has to be this way or that way. It doesn't. The Spirit's the Spirit. See, if it's only one place, it's not the Spirit. It's probably psychological. Right? That's why well, a lot of times we have music playing and I can't hear or talk to people. And I, it's funny because when I'm ministering to people, I've had people say, I can't hear you. I can't hear what you're saying because of the music. And I, I'd lean over to them and said, you don't have to. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> you understand? That spirit hears, it knows. But the person doesn't have to. Now, see, if the person has to hear me, then it's psychological. But if that spirit hears me or that sickness hears me, <coughs> sickness is a living thing, right? Sickness is a living thing. It'll kill you, but it's a living thing. It grows, right? It requires food, generally requires oxygen, right? So you, it, it's a living thing. And so you have dominion over every living thing. That's just that. Amen? Amen? All right. All right. Yep. Oh, look at there. I'm letting you out five minutes early. Look at there. <laughs> so let's go ahead and let you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on up. Um, <clears throat> turn over to, to the pastor, and we will see you back at 7, I guess. That's it. 7 o'clock, yes. 7 o'clock. Yes, doors open at 6. Our last offering. We're not taking one up, so why don't we really bless John G. Lake Ministries. As I say, each time 
none of it goes to Doncaster City Church or anything, just 100% to John G. Lake Ministries. For all the great things that we've heard, let's really bless that, uh, the ministry. I just believe it's going to be broadened more and more across the world. Great. Just a couple of announcements um, again for tonight. Please, if you do have a car parked in this church parking lot and you're not um, uh, elderly or disabled or a, a parents with prams, please, 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 could you move your car? There's plenty of car parks over across the road at the uh, council offices. So please do that. We want to make room for the wheelchairs and people that really need to be close to the doors. Am I? Oh, oh sorry, you're trying to... Chicks made out the curry black, not to judge you like ministries. Oh, yeah, of course. You know, it's going to John you like ministries, but please, if you're writing a check, curry black. Curry black. The reason we're doing that is because right now, we're just getting, setting, just getting set up here in Australia. Sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. The reason we're... The reason we're doing this, the reason we're making it out to Curry Blake is because we're just getting set up here. The last time we have to go through the nonprofit thing and all that kind of stuff to get it established here. The last time I was here, we opened up an account, but it was under my name, so we can cash checks in my name, but it has to go that way. Now, we can keep record of it and still give you credit for it, but that's the way it has to be done at this point. If you give us a check with John G. Lake, we really can't cash it at this point here. Now, I can take it back to the States. But then it has to go through currency transfer and all that kind of stuff, and it's not, not fun, right? So that's the only reason we're doing that, okay? So. Great. That's good. So you've got that. Just one more last thing. There will not be a crash set up. Uh, we need the room for the evening meeting. So tonight there'll be no childcare facilities. But, of course, if you bring your child, you need to be responsible. Okay. God bless you. Doors open at 6 o'clock, and I'll give it to Enzo. Okay. Just a couple of things. Uh, we have what we call a course assessment sheet out the back of the foyer on the table. We ask if you'd kindly fill them out and give us what you, what you thought of the course. Uh, no need to put your name on it. So they're out the back and between now and this evening at the end of the uh, healing service, we'd appreciate if you could fill them out. Uh, other thing is DVDs. Uh, the seminars have been recorded on DVDs. And if you go to the uh, Doncaster City Church website, give them a week or so, go there and you